Good morning, uh, Rev Walter here. I hope you are all well. I uh, want to take this opportunity to thank you. It's been a while since I've done a, a Facebook Live, but well, here it is. And I know most of you will catch this afterwards. So what is most important now is just to get this message out there. Uh, if you are hearing me well, please confirm by just typing a message on the phone. Just type and say, I am hearing you, I can get your voice, I can get your your image uh, crystal clear. Once you type and confirm that you can hear me well, then we can begin. Uh, as my title suggests, I will be speaking on um, those two subjects that I have mentioned. And this is because of uh, recent events for both, and I'll clarify. So just let me know if you can hear me. Just type, just type and say, yes, we hear you. Ah, great, great. Thank you, Tandiwe, for being uh, here. Thank you, Florence, uh, for being here. And everybody else who comes on the call, uh, thank you so very much. Now, let me get rushing with this. Uh, for uh, Sorry for most of you, it's Sunday, uh, probably, at, uh, you know, in church. And so we knock off much earlier. So let me go straight into this. I really, I really need to be quick. Very, uh, number one, a number of people have asked me uh, about my statement from the Z Podcast uh, ad. You know, the, 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 what you've got to understand is that when it comes to platforms like that, they will take a clip and play that. And, and many times the clip is, is literally taken midstream. It's taken between, you know, statements. So it's very difficult for one to get the full picture of what I was saying. And so unfortunately, your chances of being misunderstood, misconstrued is very high. So I want to clarify uh, and expand further. So if you haven't watched the clip, you watch it. This is a live, I can't play the clip and then explain, but let's just go straight into it. Those of you who got to catch the full podcast, you certainly know where I was coming from. But uh, because many didn't, I noticed I was challenged by a number of pastors and seniors concerning the same. So let me put it very clear. Number one, demons definitely exist. That, that, let's just get that out of the way. Demons are real. Demons possess people. The Bible has enough passages, including the ministry of Jesus Christ, where he openly cast out demons. So that's not even a debate. And then uh, what I want to now get into is the issue of what I say, because my clip clear, clearly states that I indicated that any pastor that interviews demons does it for entertainment. And I said, for me, it's rubbish. And I'm standing by that. And I'm going to explain why. Number one, the deliverance ministry is a very powerful ministry, which I subscribe to. I subscribe to deliverance. I believe that for a lot of people, I come from a school where I believe that even though people may become saved and born again, there are many instances where there may be certain aspects of their lives which have not been surrendered for whatever reason. And when those areas are not surrendered or if there are doors that are deliberately kept open, these can lead to an individual still being under the influence of a demonic entity in their life. So that's true. But at the same time, of course, we also have individuals that are not saved and they come into face to face with an encounter of a true man of God, a true woman of God who operates and calls on the power of the Holy Spirit and they can be exorcised. In other words, they can be rebuked and sent out. Now, if you follow Jesus's model, you will notice that Jesus never at any time entertained conversations. What he would do, I mean, there are tons of passages we can use the demon, demoniac of Gadarenes as a good example. What Jesus would do is literally ask a question. Who are you? And that's very important. In exorcism, the identity of the demon is critical because then you call it by name. And, you know, the Bible tells us that, you know, a name, in fact, not just the Bible, but generally we know this, that names carry the identity of an individual. So when you say, in the name of Jesus... And name the demon, I cast you out. That, that personalizes the attack. And most times that demon has no choice but to leave because you're invoking the authority of God through the name that was given that is above all names. So asking for the name of the demon is very much in order. What I refute thoroughly is a conversation and discussion 
with a demon in the, in, the, in the process of trying to probe and find out. You do not want to do that in public, number one. Because demons are like their father, the devil. They are liars. The Bible says you are, Jesus himself said, you are like your father, the devil, who was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. So everything that comes out of a demon is essentially a lie. And, and this, is, this is something that I'm really emphasizing because I have seen families destroyed, destroyed because of such situations. A demon manifests, and remember, demons possess what we call extrasensory knowledge. They, they possess supernatural knowledge. So many times they have the power of divination. They can divine. They can see things in the lives of people. And when you do such a public expose, there are many times these demons have literally pulled an item out of the life of that individual and used it manipulatively to prime people into very serious conflict. So I've heard demons saying things like, I am the father of the lady. And, and, and you know, many times it'll say stuff like that. I am the mother, I am the aunt, I am the grandmother. And it does this because it knows that there is already friction and conflict between these people. Remember, it possesses supernatural knowledge. So it will call on that and say, I am the father of so and so. And then it brings in certain knowledge, but it will twist that knowledge, knowing very well it will lead to dispute and serious turmoil. And that's the aim of the demon. So that is why any worker, any deliverance minister worth their salt never does it in public, never puts a microphone because they know that there are things that will be said, there are things that will be pronounced that can lead to total chaos. And so wisdom demands that that's done ex camera, away from people, away from prying eyes. And then also demons are known to sometimes manifest very violently. These things happen. People have had serious injuries from, 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 from deliverance sessions. So you don't just assume that everything will be okay. Sometimes these demoniacs can go into a serious frenzy. And if you're not ready, that can lead to serious injury of people. So it's very important that many times in such situations, you actually exercise a lot of wisdom in helping with the situation. That's why uh, deliverances generally are not done in public. You can rebuke and cast out a demon if it manifests, especially in a public place. But, but I, I've been in that ministry long enough. I've, I've worked in ministry long enough. And you know there are times when that demon does not leave. And it does not leave because of certain issues. There are so many issues and so many dynamics at play. Sometimes it's, it's the person trying to cast out. Who has issues sometimes it's the person with the demon is being cast out that has issues so you have to make sure that that is very clearly watched Maxwell asks a very good question so the deliverer can tell the demon is lying answer Maxwell except the Holy Spirit reveal there are many instances I speak from experiences there are many instances where the demons have managed to manipulatively fool people into falling for their trick and I think one of the best examples I can think of is the recent testimony by Apostle James Kawalia where um, Satanists were literally sent as targets to a church to disband an, an intercession group. And they were so clever in how they did. It's very subtle. It's so subtle that unless there's high levels of discernment, many miss it. And, and that's why it is usually not wise to do a public exorcism. But here's another reason that is also very, very important. In public settings, especially churches, there are many types of people sitting there watching. There are babies in Christ. There are people not, who are not saved. There are people coming with all manner of issues. And then, of course, there's experienced workers. Now, when a demon comes out, what did Jesus say? Jesus taught us that when a demon comes out of a person, it goes looking for a habitation. You see that? It goes looking for a habitation. And what the demon does is it looks for the weakest, most inviting platform. And if you've got people in that room who are not properly, you know, surrounded and guarded by the presence of God, that demon will enter right there. Uh, so somebody's asked me a question which I already dealt with. Malama, you just joined late. I already answered that. 
So you have to make sure that you do not engage such demons in such platforms because there is a high uh, probability of transference. And that's something we learned as workers in assisting people who flow in deliverance. You don't want people, that's why many times when a deliverance session is going on, Christians are told, pray, begin to pray, begin to speak in tongues, just pray. Because when you get into that state of prayer, you create an atmosphere around you that will ensure that the demoniacs really won't have room to come in there. The demons will not come. Uh, unless one has an open door, unless one has something, a breach in the gap. Uh, a gap in the, sorry, a breach in the, in the wall. So there's a gap. And so the enemies will enter that. So that's very, very important. And so I want to clarify that. That's why if I see videos... And I know some very high-ranking, very highly respected men and women of God do that on their free-to-air channels. You see them interviewing a demon and going into lengthy conversations. And people even going, you hear that? You hear that? Imagine, yes! I, I am the one who's been sending disease. You know, that, th those are demons. They lie. They lie. Lying is their nature. They are so deceptive. Don't listen to the testimony of a demon. I would never entertain the testimony of a demon. And beware that even you, as you go to these churches, if they're having such services, just start to pray, make sure there's no demonic transfer. Because a lot of people end up receiving demons that were being cast out of other people. That's why sometimes you notice people get into these ministries, if they are not careful, they end up worse than they were. And I know this again from experience. You speak to people, many will tell you that you find individuals started off well, but somewhere down the line they get into terrible, terrible lifestyles. They get into terrible manifestation of character traits you never even knew existed. Uh, that's because they are inadvertently becoming channels through which demons can come into. So generally as a rule, anybody who's been in this ministry long enough, they tell you take the demon out of the meeting. Do not heed or pay attention to demons. They come specifically to distract people from paying attention to the word. In fact, many times demons come to take attention from what was going to be a powerful word. It is the word of God that delivers. More than anything else, the word of God, the entrance of the word brings light and gives the, uh, understanding to the simple. That's scripture. So you got to make sure that that with demons, that's the story. So I wanted to clarify that because some people, I don't know what they were thinking. So I got a lot of messages. Hey, what kind of reverend? Uh, I mean, I knew this reverend is not straightforward. Well, here I am. I have clarified. But do watch the podcast. It's very, very interesting. Uh, Max is asking, what about those we see their lives change after the demons? Of course, that's what I'm saying. That once the demon is cast out, definitely a person is free. And when they are free, their lives begin to get better. So I'm not disputing casting of demons. I'm not disputing the fact that demons do possess people. I'm not disputing that we need to cast them out by calling out their name. These are not things I'm disputing. What I'm disputing is having conversations and long-winded discussions with demons because those are liars and they will lie to you, they will manipulate, they will drop bits of information in such a manipulative way that for most people who are not careful, that's how the seed of discord, the seed of angers, the seeds of bitterness are planted. So be careful with what you listen to when it comes to demons. Now very quickly, let me move on to the subject of Bishop John General. I call him Bishop John General because that's the title people address him by, um, and so out of respect for his followers, we will address him as such. We'll address him as Bishop John General. But personally, I, I am going to explain a number of things concerning that man and his particular situation right now. Uh, number one, it is extremely shameful. It is uh, extremely shameful uh, that an individual of his caliber an individual of his caliber would be found in such a situation. Now, let me quote John here. John Sadala says, you are also a problem. Why are you preaching about someone instead of Jesus? Leave the matter to God. You see, this is, this is exactly why I'm going to address this today. I'm going to address it because of that type of thinking. It's that type of thinking that is bringing serious problems in the body of Christ. And I'll address it. So let's begin with the aspect of blamelessness. And uh, I recognize the presence of uh, Bishop Shadrach Chisilo. Thank you for being part of the call, sir. Now, you know, um, the Bible talks about a person who wants to be an overseer, one of the qualities is that they must be blameless. The word blameless literally means without scandal. 
You see, blameless does not mean sinless. No, no, no. None of us can, can hold that title. None of us. It's only by grace that we manage whatever we do, even now. We are human, and by nature, we do sin. But there is a word there called blameless. The word blameless means without scandal. Without scandal. And that word scandal means tom vekam veka. Issues that get to be heard. That, oh, did you hear? You know, so and so, did you, did you hear? Oh, there was some monies that were borrowed. They never paid. Oh, you know, there was an issue that couple broke up because the pastor was having an affair with, you know, things of that nature should not even be heard from a man or woman of God. They, there should be no such tale from a man or woman of God. You should be a man or woman of integrity with an upright character trait, okay? This, this, is, this is very, very important. If an individual does not, you know, have any blame around them, then for me, they deserve the right to be addressed as a man of God. But anybody who has scandals around them, so, and, and you know what saddens me today? I'm actually hearing people saying, oh, no, he's a human. We are all human. We have weaknesses. My, the, my Bible, the words of Jesus say, and I quote, The servant who does not know the master's will and does what is deserving of rebuke and blows shall be beaten with few blows. But the servant who knows the master's will and does what is deserving of blows shall be beaten with many blows. That's scripture. In other words, when you are entrusted with knowledge, people like me, you know, you may admire and say, oh, wow, I want to be a wonderful, wonderful man of God. I want to go preach. I want to go take, you know, the, the, go and serve God as a servant of God. You may admire all that, but I'm here to tell you that with knowledge comes responsibility when you know you are held more culpable. And I'm going to give you a very, two very powerful examples from scripture, which today will deliver some of you from this idea of entertaining weaknesses. If, in fact, before I get to those examples, let me use the example of a baby. So if a baby that is three days old or 10 days old or one month old or six months old, poops in their pants after failing to poop for three to five days the adults celebrate everybody's happy oh mwana anya sorry to use that word mwana anya hey i was sure mwana you and the mongali can they are even happy they are celebrating because when they open the diaper they see poop there and they go wow this is powerful we needed this is baby needed to poop but did you know that a four-year-old child or five-year-old child who does that will be bitten why because they are five years old the question will be you don't you know where the toilet is that child will be whipped there's no way any parent is going to entertain a five-year-old pooping in their pant. They will entertain a baby because a baby is a baby. So where am I going? What I'm trying to say to all of you here, I've been hearing, and you know, it's so depressing. I've been hearing people going on, no, you know, these are, we are all humans. It's nothing but grace. Yes, I agree. Grace of God. But with knowledge comes responsibility. When you grow and mature in the things of God, you are no longer a baby. You have matured to an adult. You now have knowledge. So you are more culpable. That's the word. You are more culpable. We are not going to entertain understanding for an individual with knowledge compared to one without knowledge. That's why in this case, I am not even going to talk about that woman. I, she has nothing to do with this. And I, I, nothing, nothing. Because one, that's a follower of John General. I'll come to that. Two, these are babies in the Lord. That's why they're being manipulated. Three, they don't, they don't know any better. That's why they're even following a man like him. But the bishop himself? No, 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 no. Unacceptable. Unacceptable. A man of his caliber should never be... I mean, the circumstances are so bad. You leave your clothes there. You leave your phone there. You leave your car there. It is reported you ran naked away from someone's house. You were in their bedroom. A bishop. Sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I, I don't care what anybody tells me. That is wrong. That is blame in capital letters. Such a man does not even deserve the title bishop in front of their name. And now let me use my two examples. The two examples. Number one, you notice that Moses, what did Moses do? Moses just shouted and hit the, the rock with a stick. 
He lost his cool. In other words, he lost his temper. He shouted. He hit the rock to produce the water. And for such a simple act, what did God say? You shall not see Canaan. Now, a lot of people go, okay, the mistake versus the punishment are away. But Chidamo. But uh, let's hold for a moment. Hold your horses. Who was Moses? Who was Moses? What kind of miracles did God work through Moses? What did God use Moses for? This is what people must understand. You, you must understand that the level to which Moses had risen was too high. That's why he, God even intervened with Miriam and Aaron. Because Miriam and Aaron said, we also, we also speak to God. Who are you? We speak to God also. God also talks through us. God himself came in person and said, who are you to rebuke my servant? You I speak in dreams. Him I speak to face to face like a friend. How dare you? I'm paraphrasing. How dare you raise an accusation against this man? Instantly Miriam got leprosy. Everybody has to start begging and praying, asking for forgiveness from Moses, and Moses intervened. You have to understand that Moses operated at a very high level. His revelations were profound. The works that God worked through Moses were profound. They had reached a point where nobody could even look at Moses anymore. He had to move with a veil for the rest of his life because when you removed the veil, the glory of God was so bright, everybody ran away from Moses. That's the level Moses walked at with God. You see, the higher the level you walk with God, the harder the punishment from God. I hope people understand that. That's why Moses, for a simple, you to, me, to you and me, it looks simple. He hit a rock out of anger, rebuked the Israelites and said, there's your water. And God said, because you hit the rock rather than commanded it like I told you, you shall not enter Canaan. Too stiff. But you've got to understand, ladies and gentlemen, uh, fellow fr friends here on this platform, you are not dealing with an ordinary human being. So when you carry title, bishop, prophet, pastor, major, general, whatever it is, I'm a, I'm a man, I hear from God, when I speak, I speak the oracles of God. When you do that, my friend, you also carry serious culpability. If I make a mistake, I'm not going to be punished the same way that a lay person would be. Never. A lay person is a lay person. And a bishop and pastor are a bishop and pastor. If anything, in my books, bishop and pastor should be made an example. Two things will happen. Number one, they will be saved from eternal damnation. And number two, others will be deterred. And that's why Paul says in his episodes, make a public spectacle of their rebuke and punishment that others may fear. But you see, these days we now live in an age where everybody is trying to be nice. No, let's do it quietly. No, don't reveal who because it will injure people. Do you know you injure people more by keeping quiet and keeping it secret? Because what happens? You are silently endorsing. That's my other point. When you remain silent, when you don't make a statement, you are endorsing. Silence means consent. I remember when we were in the days of the previous regime, a number of us were, they said we didn't come out to condemn publicly. People didn't hear me, but I did on many occasions. But we were called cowards. The church was blamed because generally most of the church was quiet. Even as they watched all these evils going on, they did not speak out about it in a strong, consented way. And for that, it was looked at as one doing what? One consenting. That meant it, you were consenting. Second example, Lucifer himself. A lot of people say, yeah, you know, God, why can't God forgive Lucifer? <laughs> you know, it's a very funny statement, but I do get it on my way. You know, people, why, why, why hasn't, you know, God tells us to forgive our enemies, but God is not forgiving Lucifer. Answer, what did Lucifer know? What level did Lucifer occupy in the heavenlies? Huh? You see, Lucifer was the cherub that covereth. He was the most powerful being that God created and put his glory in him. What didn't Lucifer know? He knew everything about the secrets of heaven and the secrets of the underworld and whatever secrets they operated with. He knew everything. So that meant for a character of his caliber to rebel. Oh my God. Hellfire. 
hellfire banishment and the worst possible punishment conceivable. I see where I'm going. With the more you know, listen to me, the more you know, the deeper and stiffer your punishment when you fall. You need to understand that. The more you know, the deeper and stiffer your punishment. That's why I've said this before and people don't understand. I say knowledge is a curse. Yes, it is. Because the more you know, the more you are responsible for what you do wrong. Okay. So that's number one. Then, so, so we've dealt with shameful. He, 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 for his level, he needs to be blameless. He cannot be at his level the kind of person who is operating with this kind of scandals around them. Two, he... He, the, the silence on our part is endorsement. And that's why we speak. Because the case is in public domain, no one is going to come here and tell me and pull all this, you know, nonsense about saying he that's without sin. I mean, Christians, especially brainwashed, papa-following Christians, you take it to a new level. I mean, are you serious that you can actually pull such a, such a line on, on people? Really? unacceptable unacceptable if you are going to misbehave with that level of knowledge you deserve to be publicly hanged that's what you know and the, the metaphorical term here would be not only do we hang you we set you on fire if, if it were up to me i would set you on fire and i would set you on fire because i want an example to the others it's just that we live in a time where there's so much massaging of sin sin is like no more oh, no you know it's okay and that's why more people are failing that's why more people are falling more people are there's no examples because the people that are supposed to be example are the number one culprits a whole bishop you even you are even here saying he that's without sin it means you are the sin you are the other one sinning it means you are doing the same things. That's why you want to support such behavior. No. Even Paul himself in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, he said, I have heard in this church that there are things people are doing, which even unheard amongst the Gentiles, that a son is sleeping with his mother-in-law. God forbid that was Paul rebuking the Corinthians for such behavior. And then you come and tell me, no, we should do it quietly, pray for him, how do you pray for someone quietly and then go talk to him? I don't know him personally. All I know is he's a bishop. He's a clergyman. He should have his cover. But I can bet you go, go do a, a round right now. You'll find that man is not operating under anybody. Which is another sign. Because people that are, are supposed to be orderly sit under some kind of headship or authority. But these guys have no headship or authority because they are their own headship. So... We will rebuke. I will rebuke. And let me tell you, let me be in, on record, and I mean my record. If tomorrow, God forbid, I found myself in a situation like his, which God forbid, I will never. But suppose I found myself, I will be the first to go in public, hang my head in shame, repent publicly in the presence of elders, and go into, in, into, into what's that word? They call it sabbatical for a while, so that I may reflect and deal right with all those that I have offended by virtue of being one that has been put as a witness. Do you know what a witness is? And this is another thing again many people don't understand. A witness is one who lives a lifestyle that preaches the message that they believe. So, so there is evangelizing through words but there's witnessing through lifestyle. So all of us who call ourselves Christians are witnesses and every day somebody is watching our lives and are, we are episodes. We are episodes in the hands of God. What kind of episode are you writing? Hmm? What kind of, and, and Bishop is actually saying here, shame, it should never be heard among us. We, you, I don't even understand how people can be justifying. Coming on this wall here saying, hey, you know, you should be preaching Jesus. Muntu and Oshechi Gololo. The whole world is talking about it. Every corner on social media, they're making fun. They're making fun. They're calling names. We are being called names as bishops and pastors. And then we keep quiet. It means we are agreeing with him. It means we are saying, hey, No, no, I have refused. 
I am not part of those. I do not subscribe, nor endorse, nor entertain such behavior. Never entertained it in my 26 years of being saved. Never. Never, 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 never. Never and it will never be. Because I don't know what kind of Christianity is that. The Christianity in which I got saved. Holiness, purity, ethics, morality. These were your highlight. This was your lifestyle. You lived it, my friend. Even if it meant you laughed at. Even if it meant you lost out. Even if it meant you became sidelined. You lost friends. Let the friends go. So I don't support that. And lastly, in closing. Let me talk about the pseudo-Pentecostal movement. The pseudo-Pentecostal movement, or what my good friend, uh, uh, Pastor Jacob Ntuntu, we call him theologian, Ntuntu, he calls the spirit fire prophetic churches. Because the spirit fire prophetic churches and pseudo-Pentecostalism are one and the same thing. These churches, let me put it clear. Let's set the record straight. They are not Pentecostal. Let's put that right out in the open. The Pentecostal church is a very sober church. You check all Pentecostals, they have very solid backgrounds. Whether, whether, you're, talking, whether you're talking about, um, what are they called? PAOG, which is the, world, the most well-known, Pentecostal Assemblies of God. Whether you're talking about uh, Pentecostal holiness. Whether you're talking about, these are the traditional Pentecostal churches, very well known. And then now you come to our more modern churches, which fall under the Evangelical Fellowship of Zambia. You check those churches. We have order. We work under headship. And not headship in the, you know, the, there's now this fashion where people are becoming sons and daughters of people that are thousands of kilometers away. How, the, how in God's name is your life going to be accountable like How? You can't be accountable. That's why we're seeing all this nonsense going on in the kingdom of God because these people are not accountable. They are an answer. They are, they are an authority unto themselves. They don't sit under any kind of authority. And, and now, that's why when they start to veer off track, nobody knows. In our, pseudo, sorry, in our Pentecostal movement, we have headship, my friends. We have headship. Okay, so because we have headship, we operate under that authority. And that means when there are questionable behaviors, you will be summoned. You will be spoken to. And where there's a problem, you may actually even be forced to take a seat and reflect and repent as you await whatever will happen. That's what headship does. Now these pseudo-Pentecostals, they have fathers out of the country. So no, nobody can question anything. They do whatever they want. I mean, for me, any pastor, listen to me, any pastor who can be waiting for the envelope after the offering on Sunday and takes all of it and doesn't account either to the members of the church or even the headship, for me, no. Because anybody who operates under headship, first thing, you'll be asked to begin being accountable. These guys are not accountable. And that's why we're having the problems we're having. Sorry, this rant has taken a bit long. I should be ending now. So the pseudo-Pentecostal movement is on its own. We call them pseudo-Pentecostal because they are not even Pentecostal in the strictest sense of the word. Those guys are borderline syncretic. Syncretic means they've adopted a lot of traditions around their lives and incorporated them into the church. And so they do things which aren't even biblical and people take it as biblical. That's why they sell, for example, oil and water. You don't sell oil and water. Elements. These, in our theological terminologies, we call them elements. Now, if you are selling elements, you are attributing the power of God to those elements and then selling them? No, no, no. That for me is a no-no. And you know what? Even if you are not selling them, just the fact that you use such elements on a regular basis already indicates a, 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 doc, a major doctrinal departure from what scripture teaches. Major doctrinal, a doctrinal departure. Okay? So, well, I am here to tell you that pseudo-Pentecostals are not even, they don't even deserve to be called Christians in the strictest sense of the word. Because they are completely off track. 
And there are so many things that can be challenged about them doctrinally. You know why they become popular? Because we live in a time where people are desperate. And I've heard this excuse from a lot of people. I'll close with this. I've heard this excuse from a lot of people who say, you know, you know why these people are popular? <laughs> That's the you know why these people are popular? Because the church has no power. We find power there. My friends, let me tell you something. The Bible says, in that day, the Antichrist will come and operate with so much power that he will call fire from heaven and he will cause the image to come to life and he will perform miraculous signs and lying wonders. Scripture. And that will happen because God himself will send the delusion. So there will come a time when God will let go. Whatever barrier God has been putting, he's going to lift his hand off and say, let them be wholly deceived. Because they have rejected knowledge. Scripture says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Many people don't read the second part. The second part says, because you have rejected the law, I have rejected you. Because you have rejected instruction, I will reject your children. There you go. So a lot of people reject true knowledge. The, the true knowledge of Christ. And, and if you reject knowledge and you're looking for signs and wonders, you will get your signs and wonders. But in the process, you will be deceived, my friend. You will be one of those men who will be cheated and taken for a fool. You will be one of those women who will be slept with. The Bible clearly says that these type are the women who, who are gullible women. These are the type of men who go into homes seeking gullible women. It's in the Bible. A woman who can agree to have a bishop undress in her marital bedroom is a gullible woman. That's a gullible person. So, pseudo-Pentecostals are not genuine. So even if we call a man like Bishop, like this John General, I call him Bishop, it's because I just, it's out of respect for his followers. That man is not, for all intents and purposes, he's a charlatan, and that's been said by a number of colleagues or, and, and individuals. Not only is he a charlatan, he's a magician on the pulpit. A magician on the pulpit. And unfortunately, because people have no knowledge, no knowledge, no knowledge at all, I don't, if you, I don't even know if I should say this word, but I think so. Let it annoy somebody. If you go poor, if you go poor, wake up, my friends. Don't be so gullible. Read the word of God. Hmm? Read the word of God. Read the word of God. That's your, that's your safety. That's the place to run to. Why do you want to be cheated by these obviously fake people? And you know, that's what even makes worldly people get shocked with Christians because they can see through the veneer, they can see, but that guy is a charlatan. You can't see it. No, he's a man of God. There is, we respect the anointing. Which anointing? Trickster. That's what he is. Trickster. So these, these pseudo-Pentecostals, sorry, I'm putting it out in the open now. Pseudo-Pentecostals are not, are not genuine. They are false. Notice I didn't say fake. I said false. False and fake are different. Fake is something that's trying to imitate an original. False is something that's deceptively looking like an original, but is something else completely. So the, the, the pseudo-Pentecostals are deceptively looking like the original. And for people who do not understand, that's what happens. And by the way, yeah, let me pick up um, Mwaka's statement there. I hear you. It's so sad. Uh, Mwaka says, poor woman is desperate for a child. May God answer her. Sure, yeah. You know, those are situations, and I close with that now. Those are situations where sometimes the mysteries of God remain the mysteries of God. Why, why does God heal one and does not heal the other? Why does God answer one and does not answer the other? We, we honestly don't know. And I like, um, I like what um, um, Don Moen said in his song a long time ago. Uh, you know, the famous song that we, everybody knew. I am the Lord that he left thee. In that song, there's a part where he, he does a vocal and he says... Uh, you know, now some of you may question how come God heals this one and how come he doesn't heal that one? We don't know, but what we know is his word is true. And if he says he heals, he heals. 
and his word can be trusted and we can count on that word and we can hold to that word and we can cling to that word and we can continue to contend with that word. I have friends of mine, I just can't mention them, I didn't ask permission, who were, I've got one friend of mine barren for eight years, another friend of mine barren for 14 years, no child. I have a pastor friend of mine, three miscarriages. But they continued to contend and believe God. They continued to go into that altar and to contend with God. You know, like what Jacob did. Jacob contended with God. The Bible tells us that God told him, let me go. And he says, I will not let you go until. My friends, I'm here to tell you, God answers by fire. I have seen God answer. Even the most desperate looking situations where you have days to live. Where you have, I've seen people coming to take things out and tell you that they are going to, to, to take your house and you're going to lose everything you've had. You have this insurmountable debt. You don't even know tomorrow they are coming and God shows up in the night with all the money to pay. I've seen that. I've seen situations where someone is given three months to live with cancer. Everything is wrong. And, 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 and they tell you, you are dying. Here's the report and you look in the report and you can see the report is saying you are dying. I've seen God come through. I've seen a man that's been on a wheelchair for 10 years with a crushed disc. He, he, he was a, what's the word? Pa, a, 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 is it paraplegic? Yeah, paraplegic. Meaning paralyzed from the waist down. No movement. 10 years on a wheelchair. 10 years. I've seen such a man stand up and walk at the name of Jesus. Ladies and gentlemen, anyone who wants to call on God, God is faithful. The sad part is that we give up, we, we, we lose our focus, we, we start to, to look to the side and we become desperate and in the desperation we miss the mark. And, and that's, that's the sad part and that's why my prayer is that we can, all of us, even as these things are going on, let's learn to look to God. He is the author and perfecter of the faith. There is nothing God has promised in his word that he will not do for us. There is nothing that God has declared in his word that will not come to pass. There is nothing that God has proclaimed that we can hold on to and contend in his word that he will not come through. He will come through. And that's what everyone should remember. And I know, yes, it's desperate. You're losing children. Every child, you're getting miscarriages. And, that, and, and many times, these are the things that the devil uses as, as, as a route to get into people's lives. And it's sad because when you're desperate, you go for anything. But my prayer is that people can form bands of intercessory, you know, teams to pray for one another. Because my friends, all of us are human. There's going to come a day when we are going to be so discouraged that even a person like me will feel like giving up. And so if you feel like giving up, who is going to hold you up? That's why you must have a group of believers around you that you pray together and they can stand with you. They say, my brother, we know what you're going through. Brother, we are praying with you. This is what we need. We need people to pray with us because there will be a day we all fall. Everyone, we are human, my friends. We all fall. We all fail. And so if nobody is going to stand with you and pray with you, you will fall. And that's what's happening to a lot of these people. Nobody is praying with them. They are not part of these prayer groups where they pray together. Real, true praying as, as brothers and sisters together. Oh, sister so-and-so is going through this issue. Let's pray for her. Let's remember her. And you pray together. I assure you, me, I've seen God. The barren one, ah, there are so many. The marriage one, there are so many where God has brought good, good wives and good husbands in the lives of these people. So I want to end at that note. And so thank you so much for being part of this. Let's continue the conversations in the chat. I will certainly respond to some of the concerns raised. But once again, I want to repeat and say that when you have knowledge, you are responsible. And God will hold you to a higher standard in accountability than when you don't. God bless you. Have a great day.